Right, morning everybody. So, it sort of crossed my mind that we talk a lot about baptism, don't we, at the seminars? And in fact, baptism crops up a lot in the talks that we have. But I can't actually remember one that we've had as a talk just about baptism. Maybe we did and I've missed it. But I don't think I've heard for at least some time a talk just about baptism. So I thought that's what we'd do today. Is that okay? So... Baptism, what it's all about. So there's lots and lots of questions that we're going to try and answer if we've got the time to get through all of these. So we're going to look at what it actually is and why uh, people should be baptised, what it actually does. So if we are baptised, what's it actually going to do for you? What's it going to do for me if I was baptised? And we're going to try and look at the mechanics of how it actually works. There's a lot of symbology with baptism, but... What's actually going on? How does it work? And I think another question that perhaps we don't cover very often is what happens after baptism. So we talk a lot about, uh, you know, being baptised, but let's have a think about what happens after baptism. And the other one that I thought it might be worth thinking about is when be baptised. Because that's another one people have uh, said to me uh, throughout uh, my time as Christophian, you know, when should I be baptised? So what I'm going to do to start with is show you what I think is the most important baptism of all. And I went on YouTube and I found, uh, in fact, we're going to look at three baptisms uh, that people have put together. Clearly, we're not going to be looking at the real people. There were no camcorders and videos and iPhones back 2,000 years ago. So these are reenactments of things that have happened, but I've tried to pick ones that are very accurate as far as I see it in terms of how they're portraying it because there are some pretty weird things, as you know, on the internet. So I've tried to find ones that are uh, accurate. Which do you think is the most important baptism out of all the ones that we have recorded in the Bible? Who, 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 Jesus. Jesus. Right. Why would we say the baptism of Jesus is the most important out of all of them that are listed? And there's quite a few that are. He sets a precedent. He sets a precedent. I think that's a, a, a good answer. So, anyway, I'm going to show you this video now. It only lasts for a couple of minutes, just to get us in the mindset of baptism. And we're going to look at the baptism of Jesus. I have need to be baptised of thee. Comest thou to me? Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfil all righteousness. I baptise thee having authority from the almighty God as a testimony that ye have entered into a covenant to serve him. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So, who was that that was baptising Jesus? John John the Baptist was baptising Jesus. Now, this is, it's so simple, isn't it, when you just look at a baptism. Uh, But there's some pretty important lessons, I think, that we get from the baptism of Jesus straight away. One is the fact that Jesus himself insisted that he was baptised. Did you hear that? So Jesus himself felt it was really important for him to be baptised. John said, actually, you should be baptising me. And Jesus says, no, I want you to baptise me. What we're going to see a little bit later is the fact that baptism is all to do with the removing of what? Sin. Removing of sin. Why is it quite unusual then that Jesus himself wanted to be baptised? Because he didn't need to be 
because he didn't actually need to be, because he had no sin. If baptism is to do with the washing away of sin, which it is, and we'll see that later, Jesus actually was one of the only people, in fact, the only person that didn't actually need to be baptised. So why do you think Jesus said and insisted that he was baptised? Why do you think that was the case? Because he wanted all his followers to do the same thing. Because he wanted all of his followers to do the same thing. That is such a perfect answer. Now if you think about it, there is nothing that Jesus has asked any of his followers to do that he has not gone through himself. Nothing. So if Jesus had asked us to be baptised, but he said, do that, but of course I, I was exempt, you, you, you know, I didn't have to, then he would be asking us to do something that he didn't do. And I think out of all that, I mean, literally, we could stop at this point and say, hold on a minute, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. If Jesus is setting as an example that this should be done, and he didn't actually have to do it, then surely we should be saying to ourselves, this is super important, um, because he set an example uh, straight away. So in the passage, and this is the passage that uh, Sam read for us, this is in you know, a, a more modern version of, of the Bible. I'll just, just read it again. So it says, Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptised by John, but John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptised by you, John said, so why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, It should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. That's how it's translated in, in this modern New Living Translation. So that makes it really clear. God requires it. I'm doing it as that uh, example. And so John agreed to baptise him. And in fact, when Jesus was baptised, did you see that dove descended on Jesus? And that, they did that because it says the Spirit of God descended on Jesus like a dove, settling on him. And this is when he got what? The power of the, Spirit. the, power of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then we heard God talking, the voice from heaven saying, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. That's how it's translated in that version. I think another thing that we can sort of take from this is that baptism is all about full immersion. It, he went completely under the water, didn't he? And there's lots of references in the Bible to baptism being a complete immersion under water. And I make this point because there's quite a lot of religions out there that actually say baptism is just a sprinkling of water. In fact, there's quite a few videos on there that talk about different baptisms in the Bible, and when you watch them on YouTube, all they do is get a cup of water and chuck it on his face. Now, that is not baptism. We know it isn't baptism. Here's some verses that categorically prove that baptism is fully uh, being fully immersed. I mean, not least of which, the word baptism means to fully submerge. So the word itself means to fully submerge. Um, but in Mark chapter 1 verse 5, uh, it says, And there went out unto him, talking about John the Baptist, all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptised of him in the river of Jordan. I mean, if you're going to baptise somebody with just a cup of water, you could sure, you don't literally need to go into a river. And they're in the river. You notice that? Yeah. They're in the river. Um, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, uh, which is what we just read. Jesus, when he was baptised, went up straight away out of the water. So Jesus has, for some reason, gone into the water. Well, if you're going to fully submerge somebody, you've got to go fully into the water. In John chapter 3, verse 23, it says that John was baptising in a place called Enon near to Salem because there was much water and they were baptised. If all you needed was a cup, which is how some videos depict it, why do I need to go anywhere where there's much water? And finally, in Acts chapter 8 verse 38, um, and we're going to look at this one in a, in a little bit later, uh, he commanded the chariot to stand still and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptised him. So once again, they're going into the water. 
So I think what we can say so far is that Jesus has set this as an example for us to do, and therefore surely it's got to be something seriously important when he himself didn't have to do it technically because he hadn't sinned. And secondly, it's something very, very simple. It's being fully immersed in water. Happy with that? Okay. So, the other thing that I want to consider is, well, why do it and do we have to do it? There are many, many, many Christian groups I've spoken to over the last however many years of you know, being involved with uh, the Christalfians, which is probably all my life, but, um, well, it has been all my life, but there's been numbers of conversations where I've spoken to Christian people who've said to me, well, yeah, good idea to be baptised if you want to, but it's not, it's not like necessary. You don't have to be baptised. If you want to be baptised, be baptised. But you can still be a, 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 a wonderful Christian and still be saved without it. God isn't requiring it. Jesus isn't requiring it. I've lost count of the number of people who've said that uh, to me. So let's have a look and see whether it is an optional extra. Well, in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus says that he that believes and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned or condemned, other versions say. And I've quoted this verse to these people and said, well, there you go. And they say to me, ah, but it doesn't say that he that believes not and is not baptised shall be condemned. Now, where does the logic break down with that? Why didn't Jesus say, why did he say he that believes and is baptised shall be saved? Why didn't he then say he that uh, believes not and is not baptised shall be condemned? Get baptised if he's not been Exactly. Do you see the logic here? That Jesus is never going to say, he that doesn't believe and is not baptised will not be saved. Because, ultimately, you're only ever going to be baptised if you did believe. You're only going to get baptised if you don't believe. So, the way I put this back is, look, if I was giving this to a seven-year-old child, and or... or in fact anybody, as an exam question and said, here's that verse, you've got to base your reply, your answer on this verse, and I say to you, what must you do to be saved? And there, there, there's two marks for this uh, particular question. <laughs> what, <laughs> what must you do to be saved? What is the answer? Believe and be baptised. Believe and be baptised. And it sounds like, doesn't it, that the belief comes first, and the baptism comes second. Does, it, does, it, does that yeah. sort of make sense as well? And it also infers that you've got to understand what it is that you're doing. Because if you've got to believe and be baptised, well, I've got to understand, I've got to believe, and then I'm baptised. And only those two things mean you're saved. Now, that sounds like pretty unequivocal type of logic, would you say? I'm certainly gambling to the extreme if I say to myself, I'm just going to cross that, that word out and I'm going to make that an optional extra in my life. As a Christian, I'm just going to say, I'm going to believe I'm not going to be baptised. <coughs> it sort of makes quite a mockery, doesn't it, of what Jesus said in terms of, I must be baptised. Jesus didn't say, look, John, yeah, you're right, it's a bit optional for me. Uh, thinking about it, let's, uh, you know, I'll baptise you instead of you baptising me. He said, no, we must do this. I must be baptised. There was also something very important about the baptism that took place, and that was the Holy Spirit came upon him afterwards. Right, so God, in effect, said, as soon as you've been baptised, I'm so pleased with what you've done, I'm going to give you some miraculous power now to help you it, on, on, on your journey. Now, one thing just to clear up, of course, we're not really touching on this. When we're baptised, God does not bestow upon us the same Holy Spirit miraculous power. Jesus, at that point, of course, went into the wilderness and was tempted to do what? To do, yeah, to, to do, turn stone into bread, to take over the world, to throw himself off the temple and commit suicide and but be rescued before that happened by the angels. So, Jesus was given 
supernatural power at that point. That doesn't happen when we're baptised. It was Jesus was given that because he had got some amazing work to, to do. Well, that is such a good point. If you imagine if we were given super, be baptised, you get some supernatural power. I don't think Jesus was expecting to get that supernatural power. I'm sure he wasn't baptised purely to get that supernatural power from God. I think it was a gift from God for the fact that Jesus, despite the fact he didn't need to, was humble enough to do this thing. And it does need some humility to be baptised, doesn't it? You are basically saying, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be put, put, put under the water and brought up again. It's a, it's, a, it's a humiliating type of thing. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Peter says to this crowd, Repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the forgiveness of sins. So again, Peter doesn't seem to be beating around the bush. He says, look, if you want to be saved, you need to be baptised. If you want your sins forgiven, you need to be baptised every one of you. He doesn't say, look, think about it. If you feel like it, it's fine. If you don't, it doesn't matter. You can still be a very nice and lovely Christian without baptism. He says, every one of you, be baptised. There's one other thing I just wanted to show you, just to, I think, nail this down entirely, that it, is, it isn't optional, it is something that has to be done. People have said to me, Andy, look, it isn't about works, it isn't about how good you are. God can't be asking us to do something like baptism, because it, it just doesn't make sense. It does make sense to me, because you're actually doing something highly symbolic, just like we have the bread and wine on a Sunday, it's all symbolic, isn't it? This is highly, highly symbolic, and we'll look at what actually happens when you are baptised. But just have a look at this. In Acts chapter 10, we read about this particular man who's from Caesarea, and he's called, Corne called Cornelius. And this guy is a centurion. Uh, he's a Gentile, he's not a Jewish person, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's, he's, a Rome, he's part of the Roman army, basically. But there's something really unusual about this uh, centurion in the Roman army, and that is this. In verse 2, highly unusual, this man was a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, gave much alms, that's much money to the poor, and prayed to God always. So this is an unusual centurion, isn't it? isn't it? I'm sure if you went into the Roman army, it wasn't full of God-fearing people who gave money to the poor and were praying to God, would you, would you think? Highly, highly unusual. In fact, this chap, I'm pretty certain, is the same centurion that crops up in the Gospels that interacted with Jesus. We haven't got time to look at that, but when you get a chance, go and have a look at the centurion that turned up and spoke to Jesus during his ministry. I'm absolutely convinced it's the same person. But be that as it may, here is a devout man fearing God, giving money to the people and praying to God. And I think from a Christian point of view, you would say, wouldn't you, that this is a, this is a very good Christian person. He is fearing God, big tick in the box from a Christian point of view. He's devout, so he's not doing it part-time. He's devout, he's, 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 he's engaged in this all the time. He's giving of his wealth to the poor and is praying to God all the time. You could say this man is doing the right job. I mean, yeah, would you say? His whole family is doing well. And his whole family is doing really, really well. What then happened was, in the same chapter, a message goes through from God to um, Peter. And Peter is told to go and see this man, Cornelius, with a message. Here's another video. And so what we're going to see here is Cornelius, who's the Roman soldier, and Peter is, uh, is talking to him. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins.
Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who did believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I that I could withstand God? Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. of the very, very first Gentile. Cornelius was the very first Gentile to be baptised. And God called on Peter to go and see this man who was God-fearing, giving money and praying to him to go and baptise him. And all of those words that we just listened to are directly taken out of, of the Bible. So it's not embellished in any single way. Cornelius and his household were all baptised. If it wasn't essential, if it was just about being a good Christian and praying to God, and baptism wasn't essential, why did God say to Peter, go and see this man and baptise him and his household? That is exactly what happened. To me, this isn't an optional lecture, is it? And that brings us on, really, to this. What does baptism actually do? There's lots of things that it does, uh, and I'm going to give you a list of them uh, here. So this is the impact of this very, very simple thing, and I've got about seven bullet points that will come up now. The first one is that it washes away sin. So I don't know if you want to look at some of these passages just very quickly, uh, but this is in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Baptism washes away sin. So Acts chapter 22, verse 16 says, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptised, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So baptism is washing away sin. Now that is very, very, very important to wash away sin. Why is it a good idea to get rid of your sin? Why is that a really great thing to do? Because sin is the agent of death. Sin is the agent of death. Sin, it's because we sin that we die. Because we read in Romans chapter 6 that the wages of sin is yeah. death. So if somehow there's something you can do to get rid of sin... This is worth its weight in gold, isn't it? This is amazing to think you can get rid of sin. And actually, God says, you know something? I can wash away your sin just by being baptised. It's a heck of a deal. It's cost me nothing apart from belief and, uh, and some water. Wow. God didn't say climb a mountain. He didn't say swim a lake. He didn't say take an exam. He just said believe and do this simple thing. And yet many Christians say... Oh, we'll make that bit optional. It's, oh my goodness, how can you do that? This is such an amazing offer from God. I'll wash your sin away through baptism. The second thing is that we find that baptism is about starting a new life. And we find out lots of places that these aren't the only verses. I'm just giving you, because of time, just a few headlines. So in John chapter 3, uh, and in verse 3... We read here about Jesus having a conversation with a ruler of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher himself of, of religion. And in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said to this uh, Pharisee called Nicodemus, 
Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus says, you've got to be born again to see the future kingdom of God that's going to be established here on earth. Nicodemus, who's, I don't know how old he was, but let's call him 40, might have been older. Nicodemus says to him, verse 4, hold on a minute, how can a man be born again when he's old? You're telling me I've got to be born again, and yet here I am at age 40. How's that going to happen? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? It doesn't make sense. You can understand him saying that, can't you? Because if, if... you know, if somebody said to Phil, Phil, you've got to be born again, if you'd never heard of baptism, you'd think, well, that's a bit strange. And Jesus then says in verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, which means it's got to impact, the Spirit is life, so you've got to be baptised and it's got to impact your life. You can't just do it and, 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 and just ignore it. Is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus actually doesn't mention the word baptism here, but you can see quite clearly that this is something to do with baptism, isn't it? And in a minute, we'll come to Romans 6 that says when you're baptised, you're going to start a new life. And in other words, this is now being born again. Which brings us on to the next point, because there's two things that happen, you know, when you're baptised. One is... God, at the point that you're baptised, becomes your father. Until the point of baptism, God is your maker and creator, but he is not your actual father. In fact, of course, God is the father of how many children? Two. One. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. Isn't he? Jesus is the only begotten. Adam is not called the only. Otherwise, God had got Adam as a son, and then he's got another son called Jesus. But it doesn't say that that Jesus is son number two. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. He's his only true son. And so, there's something strange going on here, because clearly... We're told, let's have a look at this, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, that God himself can become our father, just as Jesus uh, has got God as his father. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, well, it says two things here. If you look at it in the context of this particular passage, it's talking about, in verse 14 not being unequally yoked together with unbelievers is talking about coming away from the world and separating yourself from the world and the very last thing that it says in this chapter in verse 18 it says if you do separate away if you do come away from the world um, I will be a father unto you and you will be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty yeah So God becomes our father if we go through this separation, this new life that we start. God becomes uh, our father. And and what do we become to God? We become his children, his sons and daughters. That is exactly what it is saying. In fact, we we have a hymn uh, that used to say, Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Do you remember that? And if you look in our hymn book now, it doesn't say that. What does it say? Dear Lord and Maker of Mankind. Because uh, the Chris Elkins who looked at that and when they revised the hymn book said, actually, God isn't the Father of all mankind. He is the Maker of all mankind, but He is only the Father of those who have separated themselves and been baptised. And we'll have a look in a second as to why that is the case. But we become very, very different in relationship to God once we're baptised. Well, let me explain now, because I think the next bullet point might tell us. Have a look here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Because this is another thing that happens at baptism. So in Galatians chapter uh, chapter 3, verse 27... This is very, 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 very clear, right? That something has happened that's quite unusual at baptism. 
Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. I'll wait till you've got it. I'll have a sip of tea while you do. Because this is a really important little verse here. Galatians 3, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. And when you look at the original word, that literally means to be clothed in Jesus. So what happens is, imagine that when you're baptised, God has wrapped his son, clothed Jesus around you. Now, clearly this is all symbolic. Jesus doesn't appear out of nowhere and do this. He just doesn't. But symbolically, what God says is, Andy, if you're baptised and you're doing it out of faith and you're believing and understanding what you're doing, then I will clothe you in Jesus. Now, Jesus is who? The The Son of God. Which is how it is that baptism changes the relationship from God being your maker and creator to him being your father. Because if I've wrapped... Jesus around you, yeah, and Jesus is my only begotten son, I'm now going to see you also as my son or my daughter because I've wrapped him around you. In other words, I see Jesus before I see Janet. I see Jesus before I see Sam because I've wrapped Jesus around you. If you look at verse 29, it says, and if you are Christ's, so if you've been baptised, you then become Christ's, Then are you, what does it say? Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So lo and behold, you Cornelius, Mr. Gentile, who isn't related to Abraham, therefore has nothing to do with the promises that God made to Abraham, because I've clothed you in Jesus, my son, and Jesus was, was Jesus related to Abraham? How do we know that? because he was a Jew and just to categorically make the point Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 says Abraham doesn't it it says Jesus was related to Abraham if I just look that up just so I'm not making this up Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 the book of the generation of Jesus Christ the son of David the son of Abraham so the, the whole New Testament begins by saying Jesus is related to somebody called King David and also to Abraham. So when you're baptised, because God's clothing you in Jesus, that's a heck of a deal because he now sees you as his own son and daughter. And the other amazing deal is that you're now related directly to the promises that God made to Abraham. Because Jesus was related to Abraham. So even though you're a Gentile living in the United Kingdom, or living in South Africa, or living and having all your descendancy, nothing to do with Abraham, actually we're now related to Abraham because we are clothed in Jesus who is related to Abraham. Does that make sense? And what, what's, what, what was the deal that God made with Abraham? What was the promise that God made him? In my seed will all nations of the earth be blessed. Yeah, and, and so everybody's going to be blessed to Abraham, but what's the real crux of what God promised to Abraham? they'll have the land forever God said to Abraham look north, south, east, west this land that you're in I'm going to give it to you and your descendants forever but of course Abraham didn't get that did he because he died and God isn't uh, the, you know, look, looking at Abraham and Abraham stays dead forever and ever what's going to happen to Abraham at some point he's going to be raised from the dead so baptism is washing away sins giving us a new life God changes the relationship with you instantly from being your creator to your father. He now sees you as his own child. He clothes you in Christ. You become related to Abraham, so that opens all the promises up of the Old Testament to you as well. And all you've had to do is say, I believe all of that, and I'll go under some water. And you know something? We haven't really got time to look at this, but in in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, it says that we're adopted sons and daughters. So God calls us sons and daughters, but he actually says, really, what I've done is adopted you. Jesus is my own son, my only begotten son, but I'm going to adopt you in as my own family. You imagine that, be baptised, and God is going to adopt you in and see you 
as his own child. And, you know, if you've got your own, if you did adopt children, you know, it would be a bit unfair to leave all of your goods just to your own natural children and not to those that you adopted, wouldn't it, really? Mm-hmm. And God says, I'm, I'm fair like that. I'm going to give you the kingdom, whether you're adopted or whether you are my own son. That's how amazing it is. So there's lots of huge things that happen. There isn't a bolt of lightning or a shining bright light in your face when you baptise. You get up and there's a bit of water in your face, but that's it. But God changes everything symbolically behind the scenes. All the things shift, and now you're in a different position. What I wanted to quickly do in the last sort of 10 minutes is try and show you mechanically how this works. Because it's, you know, there is emotion to become alien from God and him just being your maker to becoming a child of God is quite a big thing, isn't it? And you can imagine inside that's quite a big thing. To know that your sins are washed away is enormous. But what I thought I'd try and do is mechanically show you that logically baptism works, okay? Now, you might not like this, because this is just looking at the science of it, but here is the science of it. Imagine your life is like a seesaw, okay? So, we do something this side, uh, so this is our life and what we do, and on the other side, God responds to what we have done, okay? I'm not saying every tiny little thing God responds to, I'm looking at the big picture of our life. So, on this side of our life, we have got, have, have we got... So this is before baptism, this is just how we are. What, what sort of things have we got going on on this side of the life? Have we got sin or no sin? sin? There's sin, isn't there? And we know that because it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, and so what I'm going to do on this side of this balance here is put sin. And I've put it as a big weight because Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. So think of sin as weighing you down, getting in the way, stopping you running the race to the kingdom. So what we're going to do is put sin on this seesaw. Now what's going to happen to that? That's going to happen, all right? So sin has now pushed it, pushed the thing down. And the whole point that God does, is he's a mathematician, he's logical. He balances everything up. So if there's a minus on this side, there has to be a minus on that side to bring the thing down in to, in to back to equilibrium. So there's got to be something to, something horrible this side needs something horrible on this side to, to, to balance it. What is the thing that God puts on that side? What's God's response to our sin? Death. 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 Our death. The wages of sin is death. So on this side, so we do sin, God says, I'm going to respond with that, with death. I'm going to dig you down under the ground. The sin is going, making you go down. I'm going to dig you down under the ground. The whole thing now is balanced back up again. You see that? That's what our life is. We sin, we die. It's not a great picture, but that is as simple as it is. That is what happens. And in case we think that that excludes me because I don't sin and I have had people say that to me before it says that death has passed upon all men for that all have sinned that's in Romans 5 verse 12 the reason we die is not because of lack of medical science or because of x-rays from the sun or anything God has arranged it that all die because all sin are we all happy with that that's the end of the story but now we look at the one example in all of life, or in all of history that's different. And that's the life of Jesus. Why is he the one person that's different? Because he didn't sin. So on Jesus' side of his equation, it says in 1 Peter 2 verse 22 that Jesus did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So he never ever sinned. And we've already looked at this in Matthew how that the Holy Spirit descended on in a bodily shape like a dove upon Jesus when he was baptised and God said, I'm really pleased with what you've done. So I thought as a symbol of no sin, I'd use the symbol of a dove. Happy with that? It could be anything, but that's what I thought I'd do. So there is no sin in Jesus' life. But what actually happened to Jesus? He died. Now, I've put there that this is God's response, but you might say, well, it wasn't God's response that Jesus died, it was the Jews that killed him. 
or even the Romans that did. But do you know something? It was God's response. Do you know how I know it was God's response? God needed Jesus. Do you remember Jesus said, I don't want to do this. I don't want to die. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's God's will that I die. And in fact, it says that in this verse here. It pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. He had put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. That's Isaiah 53 verse 10. So even though it was the Jews and the Romans that put in the nails, it was part of God's plan that Jesus was to die on the cross. It was God's response. But that doesn't work, does it? How can no sin equal death? Does that balance? It doesn't balance. So what did God have to do to bring the balance back? He brought him back to life. And what he did, it says here, look, God has raised Jesus up, having loosed the pains of death, because, look, it was not possible that he should stay dead. Because God would have broken the, his rules. So, we now have, that's an empty tomb, by the way, with the stone rolled away, we've now got resurrection. We've got Jesus, after three days, being brought to life. Now, does that equal up again? Well, it does, doesn't it? Because we've got no sin equals Jesus now being alive. How long is he alive for? Ever. Ever. No sin equals eternal life. And so, but we've got this death bit getting in the way here. And the reason that there's death in there is all to do with us and our baptism, which I'm going to show you in a second. Because you could say Jesus could have maybe just kept living because he's not sinning. Maybe he could have just kept living. But if he'd done that, then he wouldn't have sacrificed, but gone through the sacrifice, and he needed to do the sacrifice to help everybody else. So he would have sinned by not actually going through with the sacrifice. Are you with me? Because God had said, that's what I want you to do. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more, death has got no more dominion over him. That's Romans 6, verse 9. Now look, here's the thing. Here's us. Happy with that? Here's Jesus. Looks pretty different. It all looks totally different, doesn't it? And the key to life is how we get from that to that. That's the trick. How do we get from that mess at the top to being in a situation with no sin and life at the bottom? And the key and the only way I can work out how to do it is baptism. It's the only thing that gets you from here to here. And here are the steps. So first of all, we have to acknowledge that we are sinful. We must repent and we must accept that Jesus is the only way to move from A to B. We must then be baptised when we understand points one to three. And then after that, after we're baptised, we continue to acknowledge that we're sinful. We continue to repent and we continue to accept that Jesus is our saviour. And for the rest of your life, you keep repeating from number five continually. You don't have to keep being rebaptized. God didn't say, every time you sin, later on, after baptism, because you will, you've got to then have another ceremony, right? Come on, David, got to rebaptize. <laughs> you've it's only been gone five minutes. <laughs> Seriously, we've got to rebaptize you again? What do you, I, I, you know, I punched the traffic warden outside, right? In you go. <laughs> God says no. It's only one. So that's a one off deal to be baptized. But then acknowledging that we're sinful and repenting continues. Happy with that? But look, here is the critical bit then. Baptism is the bit that is going to solve everything. So let me show you how that works. So we've already said, when you're baptised, you're going to go under the water. Now this is Romans 6 verse 3. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus were baptised into his death. Now isn't that weird? Why doesn't it say you're baptised into his life? 
Why does it say when you're baptised, you're baptised into his death? So that you can have the resurrection. Right. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Baptism is a pretend death. And when you come up, it's a new life. Why is it that we're baptised into his death? So down she goes, right, under the water. We're not going to keep her there for too long. Uh, Baptised into Jesus Christ's death. It says in Romans 6 verse 5 that if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, So if we've gone through a pretend death, then we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, Romans 6 verse 5 concludes. So if you pretend to die in this way, that's God saying, if you pretend to die like this in baptism, I'm going to give you the sacrifice, the death of Jesus, and because you've pretended to die, I will give you in the future the resurrection. Isn't that amazing? So look, here's our life, here's sin, and there's God's response with death. But when we're baptised, what is going to change on on that to start with? What is the first bit? The sin is washed away, but that isn't the first thing that happens. When you're baptised, you see, you've gone under the water. What's happening while you're under the water? You're associated with what? Death. 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 Right. So what, and which, and which death is God giving us? Right. He is giving us Christ. So when we go into the water, he is, forget about the resurrection bit just for a minute. He's giving us the death of Jesus. Isn't that what it said? We're under the water. The second we've gone under the water, God gives us the death of Jesus in our own personal formula. Right? But, we don't stay under the water, do we? We come up to start a new life. But now, what has God got to do with the sin on this side? He has to remove the sin because he's given us the death of Jesus. And the death of Jesus was a perfect death. He was a perfect man with no sin. This isn't just any random person. This is his son who did no sin. So what he then has to do is remove our sin. If God's going to give us that, He has to wash away that. Do you see that logically? He can't keep the sin and give us that at the same time. So he gives us the death, therefore we get no sin. And ultimately down the line, of course, what we then get, even if we die, is in the future we get resurrection. And so we get up here, be baptised and wash away your sins. That's Acts 22, verse 16. Now, do you notice something about what's on the screen now? What does that look like? What's that formula look, look like? It looks exactly like the formula of Jesus, doesn't it? So do you remember, that's where, we were, that's where we've got to get to. Baptism has changed that into that. So God, through baptism, has changed that to that, and he's therefore changed that to that. And in the future, we get, God willing, the resurrection. Do you know something? If Jesus came back today, some of us will never, ever, ever see death, will we? God is that Jesus won't come back and kill us because we're still alive when he comes back. But the reason it all works is because we have got the sacrifice of Jesus in our formula. There is death in our formula. And therefore, even though we have sinned, the equation is still balanced. We have sinned in our life, but because he's given us the death of Jesus, we will never, ever, ever, those of us who are alive when Jesus gets back, see death. That's how powerful and how amazing it is what God has given us in our own personal formula. Getting death already in your formula is an amazing gift. And it's not just any old death, it's the death of Jesus. It's belief in baptism gets us from there to there. I've just got... Here's what happens after baptism. What are you going to do after baptism? You're going to sin, aren't you? Nothing you can do about it. Well, we try not to, but we know you're going to sin after baptism. So along comes sin after baptism. And look what's going to happen here. It goes all wonky again. But remember, this bit is pre-fulfilled in. 
We've got the sacrifice of Jesus and the death of Jesus permanently in our formula. So when we go and sin, that's now gone wonky, hasn't it? Because we've got me sinning, but on this side with the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. How can we have sin and the perfect sacrifice of Jesus? The thing isn't balanced anymore. So what, what's God got to do if we ask him to? He will forgive us our sin to balance it back again. And so throughout our life, what happens is, and this is what it says in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So after you're baptised, you sin again, that gets it disjointed, we pray to God to forgive, back it comes again because I've, given, I've already given you the sacrifice of Jesus at your baptism. I sin again, it goes wonky. I ask for forgiveness, back it comes again. And there's no end of times that God will forgive you entirely your sin after you're baptised, is there? Is, does, does there come a point where God says, wait a minute, uh, Alan, that was sin number uh, 10,200, I'm sorry, that's... <laughs> Run a bit short there. I'm not doing it anymore. You've had your chips. Now, what you could say is, well, this is great. I could be baptised and go and have a wild time and just keep asking for forgiveness. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it says, God forbid that when you're baptised, you take advantage in that way. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Don't go and take advantage of it. The other thing that happens after baptism is because we become sons and daughters of God, we also have what? Family. Family, and we call each other? Brothers and sisters. Because if God is now our father, we now become brothers and sisters, don't we? We've got the same dad. That means Phil, even though I'm not actually related to him as far as I know, um, <laughs> now becomes my brother. Because God is our father. Christ Jesus Christ also Christ becomes, becomes our brother. Which means then, when you're baptised, you're joining your brothers and sisters. It's a family, isn't it? From all different walks of life, who are all also baptised. Because you can only be a brother or sister if you've been baptised, as we've said. We remember then Jesus, don't we? A key thing that we do is every week remember the fact that we've been forgiven through the sacrifice, through our baptism and so on, through the bread and wine. We then, this group, go out and preach to others about how this deal works. We preach the good news. We also help each other on the journey to get to the final destination, which is the coming kingdom of God, and we wait patiently for Christ to come. Happy with that? So the last bit really is, when should you be baptised? When does it all fit into place? I'm telling you this, there will never, ever, ever be a blinding flash of light from God or an angel stood at the end of the bed saying, thou should be baptised. It doesn't work like that anymore. God has passed over the responsibility to persuade about baptism to who? To us. It's our job to go and preach using God's word so that bit is talking to us so I would say when to be baptised it's when you understand what it means because don't do anything if you don't actually understand it and secondly you must believe what it means you can actually understand it but not believe it it is possible to do that but so belief is critical and the third thing is when you feel that you are able to commit because again don't do it if you think I'll do it but I'll only do it half-heartedly you need to be like Cornelius, who was devout. devout. And so I'm going to finish now with playing you one last video. And this video, I think, is extremely powerful because this is when Saul, who was completely anti-God, well, he was anti-Christians, uh, I should say. He wasn't anti-God, he was anti-Christians. <laughs> and the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to uh, Saul and said, Saul, I want you to go and see a man in Damascus. And this man is called Ananias, and he's going to tell you what to do next. Because I want you to be the person who's going to start preaching to the Gentiles. And so, uh, Saul at that point was blinded. He couldn't see a single thing. He was on the road to Damascus. He was blinded. God said, I want you to go and see this man called Ananias. And this video that we're going to finish with now 
is Paul sat on the floor, or Saul as he was originally called, blinded, and Ananias is talking to him, and we've just got the words of the Bible being played over above it. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. 